Lord, this morning as we gather, we lift our eyes up to see you, the one where our help comes from. And we gather to worship you. And we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would meet us where we're at, whatever's been going on in our lives this week, that you would help us to encounter you this day, to love you more, and to know how much you love us. So guide us, we pray, as we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you're able, do stand as we sing our opening song, proclaiming the goodness of all God gives us.
Yes, Lord, we want to praise your holy name. We want to thank you for who you are, the creator of all things, who is so mindful of us that you sent your son, Jesus, to come amongst your creation. to draw us back to yourself. Oh, how majestic is your name in all the world. There is none like you. And we just thank you for your mercy, Lord Jesus, upon us all. We thank you for the grace that you have poured out in Jesus Christ that amazing grace that is so hard for us to understand and yet is offered so freely to us. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And we just want to continue singing your praises to declare how amazing you are for all that you have done for us in our lives. That we are no longer bound by sin, but we are free because of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we declare together, amazing grace, amazing grace. The Lord has set you free. Let's sing together.
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your love for us. And we praise your holy name. Amen. Amen. Do sit down. Lots of stuff goes on in our lives all throughout the week and it can be uh, easy to gloss past it really quickly without actually stopping for a moment to give thanks to God for the things uh, that he has done. Uh, th- there's, a, there's a a letter in the, in the Bible uh, and it's probably one that is not your go-to letter because quite frankly, most of it feels quite depressing. It's by a prophet called uh, Nahum. Uh, If you know that letter, you'll know what I'm talking about. Uh, But I want us to uh, reflect on a verse which is in there amongst all of the uh, challenges that are within inside of that prophet's words. Uh, This is coming from chapter 1, verse 7. And I'd love us, if uh, you're able, to say this uh, together. It says, The Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. Let's say that again. The Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. And I wonder what things you might want to uh, give thanks for uh, today. So I want to offer you the opportunity to to share, as always, if you're online, uh, please post in the comments of things that you've seen. Uh, Perhaps it's in creation. Perhaps it's just the fact that when I walked up here, uh, John Levick hasn't cleared up after himself and I'm blessed with a packet of love hearts. Yeah, uh, you know, if you weren't here last week, then you're missing out, clearly, okay? So uh, thanks, John. I'll, uh, yeah, that's, that's good. That's it. <laughs> there it is. Uh, but what would you like to share about? What have you seen of God being good to you uh, this, this week? How can we share? And who's going to run around with a mic for me? Lara, brilliant. There you go. Give us a wave in the air. Thanks, Phil. About five weeks ago, I went into hospital and got a hip replacement. And before I went in, I was absolutely scared, dead scared of going in. And when I was waiting to go into the theatre, I said to Rosemary and my son, I'm going home. But I didn't, and the operation went very successfully. And the nurses and doctors were absolutely fantastic. And I had prayers from Australia, Torquay and here, and thank God for that. Amen. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Alan over here. You've got to go all the way around. Speed, speed. This is all about running. That's why I'm not doing it. Lara, right up the middle, underneath the screen. There we go. I just want to give thanks and testimony to the word verse we have on there. The Lord is good and he's a refuge in times of trouble. And at the time of trouble that we had 10 days ago, we knew he was there with us in that consultation. And uh, with hope and a promise from him, I look forward to what will come in the future. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Down the line. Dorothy. I too am recovering from hip surgery and praise the Lord, I was able to drive the car this morning for the first time in two months. Yeah. That's great. Chris. A very similar vein. I'd just like to thank the NHS, especially for uh, what I've received this week. Amen. For the sunshine this morning. For the sunshine, yeah. Anyone else? Paul. Hello. There's a friend of mine from Kenilworth. He uh, he had pancreatic cancer. Um, He had three parts of his pancreas removed. And he was in the hospital a few weeks back, and a man came up to him, a stranger, and told him he got cancer and laid hands on him, and his cancer's gone. He had a test a week after, he's totally gone. The doctors don't understand it. Amen. That's amazing. Praise God. Thank you, Paul. 
and let me offer you one uh, online. Thank you, Lara. Uh, from Joyce, who wants to give thanks that yesterday she was discharged from the uh, cataract clinic and that her son, uh, Michael's eyesight, uh, was preserved by doctors by intervention yesterday. Praise God for that as well. Absolutely. Uh, let's join together in giving thanks. Lord, we want to thank you that you are present in all areas of our lives, whether uh, it feels like it's a good season for us or it feels like it's a time of trouble. Thank you that you are an ever-present help. And we want to give you thanks for creation. We want to thank you for the, the signs of life that are appearing all around us, uh, the changing of the season. Lord, we want to give thanks for the uh, medical support and intervention that you have blessed us with, the gifts of people to, to understand your created body and to, to help uh, try and fight some of these evil diseases that are out there. Uh, Lord, we want to thank you that you continue to uh, be someone who supports us and encourages us when we face uh, times of trial. Thank you that your spirit is with us all the time. And Lord, we want to thank you that you are a God of healing and that you still work miracles today. And we want to thank you for that testimony of all that is has done in and through that person Paul just spoke of. May all glory and praise go to you, Lord. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. We live in a world which says, my story is important. Uh, and these testimonies are things that we are able to share with others as reflections of what Jesus has done for us and that then we can tell others of. And our next uh, hymn declares that we have a blessed assurance in the one who we are proclaiming to other people. If you're able, please stand with me as we sing together.
Amen. Do sit down and let me share a few pieces of uh, family news. Uh, first, to remind you that on uh, Tuesday, it's uh, the next in our pause and pray days. So an invitation to you to join in during the uh, Lent season to be thinking about how you can intentionally make time to be with God. However that looks for you in your life uh, and all the things uh, going on. Uh, and one of the invitations as part of that is to be joining in with a uh, book uh, reading. We're working through the uh, Ruthless Elimination of Hurry book by uh, John Mark uh, Comer. Uh, we're only into the second section because we're taking our time to try to rest in what we're hearing and thinking about what that means for us. Uh, and so if you uh, still want to pick that up and join us, uh, then you're very welcome at half six, we have just the general prayers on that day, and then around seven o'clock, uh, we spend a bit of time reflecting on the book for those who have done it. Uh, so the open invitation for you, an email goes out, uh, respond how is uh, helpful to you. Uh, on Friday uh, this week, we have uh, the World Day of uh, Prayer, and as part of that, uh, the uh, churches gather together, and this year at Warwick Methodist Church, uh, to reflect on a service uh, called I, I Beg You Bear With One Another in Love. And so if uh, 11 o'clock you are able and around, uh, then you'd be very welcome to join with other churches and around the country and indeed around the world uh, praying uh, together. And then on Saturday, uh, we've been plugging this as a partner church with uh, Thrive Youth Ministries. Uh, we want to encourage you, if you're able, uh, to use this as an opportunity, the Gospel Illusion Show, to, to take friends uh, along. Because uh, whilst it is a show of illusion, uh, it is also uh, an opportunity for a very subtle uh, gospel message to be offered as well. And so we've talked as church about building relationships uh, and the next stage from that is for them to trust you to take them to things which are appropriate for them and for you to then uh, allow someone to, to share the gospel as well as you sharing the gospel. Uh, and so if you've got time, if that's something that fits with your schedule, uh, then uh, that's at St. Paul's on Saturday, uh, starting at 7.30. Uh, the link went out in the newsletter, so you can get tickets still uh, from there. Please uh, do support that if you're able. Right, it's time for our uh, children and young people to be heading out, and we're going to pray for you before you run. Uh, so let's just uh, pause and pray together. Lord, thank you for the opportunity yesterday uh, to take time out to pray and fast for our children and young people. And Lord, we recognize that uh, uh, we all have so much contact with uh, different children and young people throughout the week. Uh, through the various places that we go, or most of us do. Uh, and Lord, we want to pray your blessing on those you have entrusted into our care. Lord, we want to pray your blessing on the leaders who have been preparing for the sessions today. Lord, might your Holy Spirit work in their lives. Might they come to know more of that amazing love for them. Uh, and might that turn into a commitment to follow you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Children, young people, I think everyone here knows what's going on, just looking around. Yeah, so I encourage you to uh, head out to those uh, groups. And if you're staying in here, uh, then why don't you turn to someone who you haven't spoken to yet, who maybe you don't even know. It might mean you have to move, and that's okay. We don't mind. Uh, and just uh, say hello, give them a greeting, introduce yourself. Well, do continue those conversations later on over a, a drink after the uh, service. Do hang around online. Uh, there's breakout rooms for you to chat to one another too.
There's a story in uh, 1 Kings 19 that speaks about an encounter uh, with God with a man called Elijah. And in that Bible verse, it says, uh, The Lord said to Elijah, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. And then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. And that must have been pretty scary. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake. Also pretty scary. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. And when Elijah heard that gentle whisper, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the face of the mountain. We can be people who are in environments where it's quite noisy a lot of the time. And so I just want to invite us, uh, and if we could have the uh, Namdi, the verse up again from earlier, uh, the Nahum verse, that'd be great. Uh, I just want to invite you to take a few minutes to sit in the still of this space. It's not going to be quiet. We know that. But we can be still. And I want to invite you to reflect upon these words from Nahum, that the Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble, he cares for those who trust in him. What is the spirit prompting you to be reflecting on in your life at the moment that relate to those words? Let's just be still and know that he is God. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you can speak to us in so many different ways. And we're sorry, Lord, for the times where we make ourselves so busy that we don't slow down to seek to listen back to what you have to say to us. Lord, help us to take seriously the need to find time in our days to slow down, to be with you. Even if that is just the two and a half minutes that we just experienced then. Because you long to speak to us and you long for us to hear. So guide us, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let me offer you a word that is so very popular amongst uh, ourselves and the world these days, and that word is sin. Oh, yes. All happy where this sermon's going. Sin. Sin. I've given you a definition of uh, sin before, which is this. Shove off God. I'm in charge. No to your ways. Shove off God. I'm not interested in what you've got to say. I'm interested in what I've got to say. I'm in charge. No to whatever you're telling me. Simplistic, maybe, but offers you a general catch-all for how you might think about whether the way you're living your life is in line with God's way or your way. 
And as Christians, uh, we know that uh, if we have trusted in Jesus, then we are children of God and uh, that we are held in his hands and we are, we are dearly loved. But if we're in that honest moment, in our safe space, talking with those people we trust, then I think we'd also be honest to recognize those moments of rebellion within ourselves as well. Those times where we want to say, and probably I would imagine have said, shove off God. I'm not interested in what you want me to do. I'm going to do it my way. Well, over the coming weeks, I want us to explore a bit of what that means for us uh, in a new series entitled uh, Called to More. Uh, and we're going to explore the, the actions, the, the habits and the, the systems that work to separate us from God's ways and to look at the cross of Jesus as we remember that we're called to so much more. Because not one of us is immune from our wrestle with sin. And so what better place to start in this conversation than to listen to the words of Jesus. And I want to invite you to uh, turn in your Bibles uh, to John, John's Gospel. So we're in the New Testament Uh, And chapter 10 is where you're looking. I want to encourage you to open up a Bible or open up an app, however you do it, so uh, that you're engaging uh, with God's word yourself. You know where it is. Uh, You're able to find it later if you want to reflect on it. So we're looking uh, for John 10. And we're going to be jumping in at verse 7 to 11. It's part of a bigger uh, talk Uh, which you can catch up on later, Uh, but verses 7 to 11. Anna uh, is going to come and read that for us and pray for us. So John chapter 10, verses 7 to 11. Therefore, Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Lord, thank you for this word this morning. Thank you that we have the privilege to hear your word freely today. I just pray for each one that we will hear from you, that you would speak into each heart in the way that we may individually need it today. Thank you for for your words through Kevin this morning. Thank you that they do bring life to us. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to start by talking about planes. Planes, uh, apparently, when uh, you're training, uh, there's two ways that you can fly a plane. One is the most obvious one, right? What, which is? What do you use? Your eyes, hopefully. Okay, so you can look around you, you can see what's going on, and you control the plane through your own knowledge and senses of, of what's going on. And everyone goes through that stage. That's stage one of learning the plane. And if you've got hundreds of thousands of pounds, uh, you can go ahead and and do that training. Uh, But there is a second stage that you can also do, which is called being instrument rated. And this is where you're able to use all of those crazy dials all in front of you that we see uh, on the movies uh, to help you fly in low visibility and even through clouds. Now, it turns out that uh, when people are going through this second part of training, the majority of trainees who fly into a cloud will almost inevitably come out of the cloud upside down. 
Uh, and why do they come out of the cloud upside down? It's because they are still trusting their senses and not the instruments that they're being taught to follow. Their brain tells them one thing, but their eyes and the instruments tell them another. And they decide to choose which one uh, they want. And I was thinking that when I heard this, I thought, we can be like this, can't we? We, we can go through uh, life and, and look around at the horizon. And when it's all clear, we can, we can fly free and easy. We can find it easy to navigate where we want to go. Uh, but at other times, we can end up in clouds. Uh, and we can find ourselves still trying to navigate by what we think and the senses that we're getting, rather than focusing on the things at God's will for our lives in those times. And I don't want to deny that it can seem like it's working for a time, you know? That we prioritise a, a pipe dream, or we might get obsessed about our car, or even uh, the enjoyment of new technology. We get lost in those worlds as we learn more. Uh, we might make travel or money our God. It becomes the thing that defines how we move forwards. Uh, we might care more about what other people think of us than what God thinks of us for a period of of time that can be important to us and perhaps even things like and you can enter your own category here food or drink or whatever it is for you can become your go-to comfort in times of trouble that they become your senses as opposed to the guiding instruments of God's word. Uh, perhaps even binge uh, watching on TV or YouTube or whatever it is that, that removes us having to worry about what's going on in the world is okay for a time. But at some point, we have to realise that some of these things and some of the ways we use them are bad for us in and of themselves. And it's when we allow them to shape our lives over Jesus that that becomes the case. When they become our guide, our, our comfort, our, our sustenance, that's when the problems come. For then, they're separating us from the source of life in all of its fullness. We find ourselves disconnected from God. We can find ourselves, you might even know this phrase for yourself, you can find yourself in a spiritual rut. Yeah, you just feel like God is absent. And when we stop long enough to assess what's going on, we can soon realise that actually the problem probably comes back to us. That we've taken our eyes off Jesus, that we're depending upon the wrong guidance system, that actually we find ourselves flying upside down. And so how is it then that we are able, as Jesus says, for us to enjoy life to its full how do we fly through the challenges of life? The, how do we face the temptations of sin and not find ourselves flying upside down. Well, we're going to build as we go through this series, including uh, the All Age Talks. They're all going to be building on this series uh, as we think about this as a process. Uh, and we need to start by having confidence in who Jesus is and trusting in his word as he reveals himself as the gate and as the good shepherd. And so an obvious question would then be, so what does that mean for us? And we're going to take a few moments to have a think about that together now. You see, Jesus starts in our passage today in verse 7 and 9 by claiming, I am uh, the gate. These are uh, claims, I am uh, statements that go through John. There's seven of them uh, defining the character of, of Jesus. Now, when, when we think about a gate, uh, if you're anything like me, then you're thinking of fencing or you're thinking of metal structures. Uh, that's our kind of uh, interpretation of the word because that's the world that most of us live in over here. Uh, but if we go across to first uh, century Bible world, uh, then what we're actually having to think about is big white stones which are stacked one on top of the other up to about three foot tall. Okay, apparently these are in abundance uh, around in the 
fields. And these are what the shepherds would use to build a pen to bring their sheep into. And as the sun comes down, the sheep are then led in to protect them from predators and thieves. And logic would suggest that for security then, there is only one way in and one way out. And that is what you might describe as a doorway. Uh, and in other Bibles, you might find this passage using the word door. Uh, but Jesus describes himself as a gate. And that's because the shepherds would effectively lay across that hole where the sheep would come in and out, and they would be the gate. Nothing goes in, nothing goes out without the shepherd being in the way. Jesus says in verse 9, I am the gate and whoever enters through me will be saved. Jesus is using this metaphor to talk about what it means to make him our Lord. And this is an exclusive claim that the only way to salvation is through him. And if you think I'm just misinterpreting uh, his word, and that's fine, I appreciate that, uh, we then need to look elsewhere and just make sure I'm not making these things up. Uh, so we turn to Jesus' words again in John 14, they'll be on the screen, uh, where it tells us that Jesus was speaking to some people and he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Our society is very open to all sorts of ideas about spirituality. It loves the idea that everyone should have their own faith and everything should be acceptable to everyone. And as Baptists, uh, we support that principle too, that we want freedom of religion for everybody because, quite frankly, if we can't offer it for everyone, we can't have it ourselves. Okay? And so if we want freedom to be able to speak about Jesus and to tell others about Jesus, then we need to also champion that other people, even if we don't agree with them, even if we think it's false, that they should at least have the freedom to speak because we need trust that God will speak up and above what they are saying and will make himself known in the person of Jesus Christ. But what they don't like and what you will find pushback on if you haven't already is this claim that Jesus is the only way. That Jesus is the only way. It's hard. It is a hard truth to hold on to, but if we are to trust what God teaches us through his words, then there's not a way that we can get around this. Oh, well, hold on, Kevin. Perhaps the early church approached it in a different way. Perhaps Jesus said this, but then they, they learned better. Yeah? I mean, it can happen, can't it? Maybe, maybe I'm just misunderstanding Jesus. Well, let's, let's look at the early church. Let's look at Acts 4. Uh, and it, with inside of a crowd of people, the early church and the apostles are there. And the apostle Peter stands up and he says, uh, and he's spoken about Jesus as the cornerstone. So he's talking about Jesus here. Salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given by which we must be saved. It's a teaching of Jesus, which is really difficult, but is true. That we are offered salvation in Christ alone. But what is it then that Jesus is uh, saving his sheep from? What is it that this metaphor unpacks for us uh, if, we, if, this is, if this is to be true? Well, in verse 8 and 10 of our passage, we're told that uh, Jesus is, to, is protecting them from thieves and from robbers, those who seek to steal, kill, and destroy. Well, first of all, that's amazing that the shepherd cares that much about his sheep that he's willing to do that. But then that also sounds incredibly serious to me about the consequences that are coming to those sheep. Now, if you know John's gospel well, you'll know that he loves to, to zoom out, to, to look at the cosmic level throughout his, his word. He sees the, the big picture. So chapter one, we hear in the beginning of everything was the word and the word was with God and the word was God in the beginning. He's, he's right out there back at the start of, of, of whatever. 
And it's saying God was there and Jesus was there and the Holy Spirit hovered over the deep. And in chapter 3, he then goes on to say those famous words, for God so loved the world. Absolutely, the whole world. So at one level here, Jesus is refuting all those who have claimed to show that there are other ways to God other than via him, the gates. That we only need to look back in the Old Testament to see time and time again, this is a constant narrative. God says, follow me, get rid of those other gods. They are not true. Don't follow them, follow me. And we only need to look around in our world today and the encounters that we have, and that is the same question for us. Do we trust in Jesus as the only way, the truth and the life, or actually are we going to turn to tarot cards? Are we going to turn to horoscopes? Are we going to turn to other superstitions to be the things which are going to help us? Are we going to turn to good works to help us get over the line, if that's how you think about it, or are we going to trust in what God tells us in his word, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. See, the whole false hope that you can get in other places is dangerous because it kills and it destroys. Uh, Jesus says this in, in John chapter 3, verse 36. It's on the screen. He says, He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he does not believe the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abides on him. This is the the bad news that is out there in our world, that those who don't believe are already dead in their trespasses and sin. That we were dead in our trespasses and sin. That we were under the wrath of God. And that means, friends, we need a rescuer. We are like sheep who have gone astray. And there is no way that we can rescue ourselves. We need God's intervention. We need God's mercy. And this is the good news. This is the amazing news. That God in his mercy, whilst we were still sinners, sent Jesus to seek and to save the lost. As the good shepherd, he he lived the perfect life and yet allowed himself to be killed on the cross, taking on himself all the sin of the world, past, present and future, the wrath of God upon him. And yet after three days, he showed that even death could not hold him. That he rose to life as he had promised, making a way for all those who will believe in Jesus to be restored in relationship with Father God. Oh, such amazing good news. And here's how the Apostle Peter puts it with the, with the sheep metaphor. There's three slides here, Namdi. So uh, this is from 1 Peter 2. And uh, this is the message transliteration, uh, so not a translation, a kind of interpretation of the words, which I think just helps us to get the sense of what he's saying. This is the kind of life you've been invited into, the kind of life Christ lived. He suffered everything that came his way so that you would know that it could be done and also know how to do it step by step. He never did one thing wrong. Not once said anything amiss. They called him every name in the book and he said nothing back. He suffered in silence, content to let God set things right. He used his servant body to carry our sins to the cross so we could be rid of sin, free to live the right way. His wounds became your healing. You were lost sheep with no idea who you were or where you were going. But now you're named and kept for good by the shepherd of your souls. 
Jesus is the gate offering salvation. And anyone is welcome. This is the amazing free gift of grace from God. Uh, We don't deserve it, but it's offered freely to all who will believe. And none is too bad, none is too good, none is indifferent in the middle. All lives can be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit at work. But only, only if you enter through the gate, through faith in Jesus Christ alone. And if that's something that you haven't done, if that's something that you come from a a culture maybe which just says you are a Christian, this is not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, actually, you have to choose for me. You have to make a commitment uh, to me. And again, let me offer you a simplistic thought on this, which is the ABC, that you need to admit you need rescuing from sin by repenting. You have to recognize there's a problem within us and we need a savior. We have to believe that Jesus is the one who can save, who died upon the cross and and was raised to life to pay the price to set us free. And then we have to confess with our mouths that we trust in him. For our faith is not a secret thing. It is something that we want other people to know about too. This is something you've done. For when we have accepted Christ as our saviour, he also then becomes our Lord, the one who invites us to, to follow him, the shepherd who shows us the good ways to live. And our response out of amazing love that he did for us is to lovingly respond in how we live out our lives. That we choose to put death, to, uh, sin to death so that we might follow him in our ways. And that is a lifelong journey, but it's one that he sends his Holy Spirit to help us with. And as we go on that journey, we find in our passage again that it reminds us that Jesus as the gate is one who offers us safety. Now, anyone who's been a Christian for some time will tell you that being a Christian is not gonna make your life easy. (laughs) It's not gonna make your life simple. It's not gonna solve your problems overnight in teen. In fact, it might not solve your problems ever. Uh, But Jesus himself even promises that life will be difficult if you choose to follow him. But in verse 9, the second half of it, we get this image spoken about, about the sheep going in and going out. And this is an image in the Bible of of us feeling safe, of us having security in the good shepherd and the sanctuary that he offers us. You know, just think about wartime, okay? Again, in uh, the old days, uh, if there is a war going on, then all the people are going to rush inside the walls and they're going to stay there, trusting in the army to protect them until they're safe. They're under siege. They want to stay safe. We hear about God being our strong tower. Yeah? Similar image. Come into God and stay safe. But then in peacetime, in peacetime, we hear this language in the Bible of people coming and going as they please. Of knowing that the good shepherd is always there, but having the freedom to move around in their light. Um, We see this in the Old Testament, Moses, uh, when God said to him, hey, your time is up in the nicest way. Uh, He goes up on the mountain to pray. And this is what he prays. Uh, This is in Numbers 27. He says, Moses said to the Lord, may the Lord, the God who gives breath to all living things, appoint someone over this community to go out and come in before them. One who will lead them out and bring them in So the Lord's people will not be like sheep without a shepherd. Were their lives any easier after Joshua was appointed? Nope. But did he always, as a shepherd seeking God, guide them and give them security? Yes, he did. For in Christ we can know that no matter what happens to us in this life, by trusting in him, we will be held fast 
for all eternity. You'll know these verses, but this is how Paul puts it in Romans 8. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angel nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amazing words. Such an encouraging promise. And that's why Jesus also tells us that he is the good shepherd. He's not like the thieves and robbers who prey on sheep for their own selfish ends and then run away when the enemy comes calling. No, the the shepherd, the good shepherd, our Lord Jesus, comes to give, not to get. He provides security and safety for his flock. That even in the midst of life's storms, he will always be there. Even in the ills of this world attacking our mortal bodies, he will hold us fast. He will never leave us or forsake us. He's the one who has come to give eternal life to all those who love him to grow them in a a love for the eternal and not for the temporary which our bodies seem to want. He comes to transform our lives by the power of his Holy Spirit, giving good fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. And we find in the Good Shepherd that he offers us what's called abundant life. Life in all of its fullness. And this, friends, is not about a wealth of material things or financial things or status, the temporary of this world. It's not even about good health and well-being, though he may bless us with those things. All of them are a worldly take on what is going on here. The fullness of life that Jesus offers us is one of meaning, of purpose, of joy that is eternal. A true knowledge of his presence in all we face because, friends, he cares for you. Psalm 23, I invite you to go back to it later, to read it and to replace the Lord with the word Jesus. But Psalm 33 puts this perfectly and reminding us that in all circumstances, even in the presence of our enemies, even in the valley of the shadow of death, the good shepherd will be with us. His rod and his staff will comfort us. And for all who will receive him, who will proclaim Jesus as their saviour and follow him as their Lord, he invites you also to call him your good shepherd. Now is sin still present in this world? Yes, it is. Is the evil of illness, which is so awful, rife in our society? Yes, it is. Does the devil keep trying his best to disrupt us away from Jesus? Yes, he does. But friends, Jesus is greater than all of these things. And as we journey with him together, It's vital that we remember, therefore, that none of us is exempt from sin. None of us. We all fall short. We all sin, including me. And so we must encourage and support one another as we seek to deal with these things in the presence of Jesus, not to condemn. Even when we are called by God to challenge someone about their life with uh, walking outside of Jesus' ways, this is not about condemnation. This is about helping them to be restored, to restore themselves, not pointing the finger. And though even we might stray, and some may be further than others, Our loving Lord Jesus, the good shepherd, is always calling to us that we're called for something more. That he's calling that we will hear his voice to return home to him. 
that he offers us safety and security in him, the gate, to make us more like his son each and every day as he replenishes our souls. And so as we journey through this series and as we wrestle with these things in our lives, we must remember that Jesus promises for all those who trust in him, the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep, not only will he help them stay the course through those stormy days, weeks, or even years, but even when we make mistakes, even when we give in to sin, even when we fall into temptation and distraction, we are to know that we have a God whose grace is still bigger and that he is still stronger and that he longs to help restore those who look to him in repentance, that he will give you strength to fight another day and that he will surround you with allies who will love and care for you as you seek to walk the path he's set before you. For he wants to shape you and grow you as his disciple. And by keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus, following his guide for our lives and trusting in him, then friends, we will come out flying the right way up. Sin is not something we should celebrate. It's not something, it's something that definitely needs dealing with. But to do this, you need to start in that place that you know that God is for you and not against you. That he will not leave you or forsake you. That he loves you and cares so deeply about you that's why he's convicting you about this. That he is trustworthy and true. That his word guides us in a way of love and not a condemnation and wants to help you to live your life in the fullness that he would want, not hampered by sin. So the question for you to take away first of all is, will you be brave enough to trust what he's told you about himself? Will you be brave enough to trust your life into his hands that he wants good for you? And the question today is, how will you receive this gift of God's abundant grace and love today? And if you haven't, will you respond by proclaiming him your Lord and Saviour this day? Let's just take a few moments to, again, be still and to allow God to speak to us about what he's been saying. Lord, thank you for revealing yourself as the gate and the good shepherd. Thank you for making a way for us to be at peace with God. And thank you for that open invitation for each of us to respond to you in faith. Lord, we openly admit that we all have sin in our lives that we are aware of, and sin in our lives which we don't know about. And Lord, we find it embarrassing to tell other people about it. And yet you invite us to meet with other people to support and encourage one another as you minister to our lives. 
And so we, I want to pray for each person listening that they would find and be convicted of the right person to support them in their journey during this Lent season. That as we seek to offer to the Lord those things that are not of him, that reject his ways and put ours first, that we would be giving thanks as you change our hearts and you help us to walk the path that you have set before us. Help us keep our eyes fixed on you, Saviour, who is a shepherd, the one who leads us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing a song in response. Uh, Feel free to continue praying if that's uh, helpful to you at this point. Uh, I thought this would be something that uh, we knew, but apparently not. It's an old hymn, which uh, we've kind of been reharmonized as a a newer one. Uh, It's called Saviour, Like a Shepherd, Lead Us. Much we need thy tender care. Uh, If you do know it, then you can sing with us on this first verse and chorus as we uh, teach it to you. Otherwise, and then we'll go back to the start and we'll sing it together as a a response uh, to our Lord Jesus. Thanks, John.
continue in prayer. Gracious and loving God, we want to thank you that we can bring any type of prayer before you, that you invite us to share with you the things that are on our hearts. And Lord, there are many and they are varied. And I just voice a few of those prayers for us now. We ask for your mercy and your peace to fall upon Ukraine and Russia. Lord, as we enter the second anniversary of that conflict, so many people have died. So many families are still grieving. So much unknown is going on and rumours of more war in that area are circulating. We ask, blessed Jesus, would you minister to those people? Would you bring peace in that land? Lord, would you change the heart of Vladimir Putin? That he might see your ways and have compassion and love on the people who have been put in his care. We pray for the churches uh, in, in and around uh, Ukraine, for the Christians who are seeking to minister to those who have fled, those who no longer see home uh, in any way as being able to return to. Father, give them the right words to say. Help them to be your presence. To offer the help that is needed at the right time. And even in the midst of these tragedies, Lord, we pray that more would come to know you. That people in Russia would come to know you. That lives would be eternally saved because of your good news. As we look closer to home, Lord, we pray for for our king and for our government, Lord, for our king with his health concerns and uh, for all uh, that is going on for him and his family. Lord, would you enable him to be aware of your presence with him right now? And would you use him to proclaim your goodness to his country? Lord, for our government who is in disarray over so many things and uh, in arguments about so many things, as they all vie for the, the want of power coming up in the next election, Lord, would you turn those eyes to you that they might seek you for wisdom and guidance? Would you use the, the Christians in politics to speak your goodness and your wisdom into situations and would they be heard? Lord, would the everyday person in the street not be lost? Would they recognise their responsibilities and live out their responsibilities for the least and the lost, the most broken around this country? And indeed, Lord, would you open our eyes in our own towns and our own areas to those who are broken, who are in need of help, and would you enable us to know how best to respond to them? Would you open our eyes to see what we can't currently see so that we might be beacons of hope where we go in Warwick and beyond? Lord, we want to pray for our uh, children and young people who are facing uh, exams at this time. Uh, Whether that's SATs or mocks or uh, university exams. Lord, we pray that uh, they would know that their value is not found in those exams, but in you. And Lord, that we would be people who would encourage them, that we would support their parents as they walk with their children. Lord, that we wouldn't seek to solve their problems, but we would be at your presence to be alongside and encourage. Father, prompt us to whom we should send messages of encouragement, those we should uh, speak to. And we pray for the teachers with inside of our community and those who work within schools. Uh, Lord, with all the pressures that are on them at these times of year. Uh, Lord, especially we thank you for the way that you have helped uh, the two local schools and been watching over them during their Ofsted inspections. 
We thank you for the privilege of being able to tell them that we're praying for them and that we have the privilege of prayer. And Lord, we want to also remember our own congregation and all uh, the, that's going on for us. We want to uh, name before you those who have uh, meetings or appointments in the next week. Lord, those who are supporting loved ones, uh, those who are facing recovery or illness themselves. And uh, many of those don't want to be named publicly, but I, I just speak these names. And if you know their situations, then uh, please just take a moment to pray and I'll leave a gap for us to pray for others in the private of our hearts. And so Lord, we lift up before you Pam. Kazal, Mary, Chris, and Alan. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you know each and every situation of those spoken and unspoken in this space. And we pray that you would work in their hearts and you would use us uh, to support and encourage as your family, this church. And Lord, we do pray that we would see miracles. We do pray for healing in those bodies where there is brokenness. So Lord, we offer all these prayers to you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. As our service uh, draws to a close, come on in guys, welcome. Uh, we're going to sing a closing song uh, which puts into song the words of Psalm 23 and declares that we will trust in Jesus alone. Uh, if you're able, do stand with me as we sing together.
So to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Saviour, be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. We have a a team who are willing to uh, pray with you about anything which has been laid on your heart today. Give it a few minutes and then they'll be over by that rooted poster over that way. Uh, Just head across and have a chat with them. Um, If you want to learn more about giving your life to Jesus and committing to him, then you can chat with them, chat with someone around, or indeed grab me on the door. We'd love to talk more with you about that. Do stay for drinks of coffee and tea and we'll see you soon.